Now we have a very special opportunity to talk to two people. First, I'm going to talk to them and, and reap the benefits of that opportunity. And then you can ask questions as well. So I'd like to bring Jeff on stage, as well as Phil Jones of Northern Power Grid. Phil, Jeff, join me. There you go. Thanks. Have a seat. Jeff, I loved your remarks, but I was um, struck by uh, one thing, it seemed to me that this is one of those big bets that defines a tenure for a CEO. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a journalist and I tend to overhype things. <laughs> so tell me, um, how do you position what GE is doing in terms of uh, what it means for the future of GE? And while you do that, could you pass me the water? Sure. Great, thank you. There you go. Thanks. And a class. So, you know, I think the, um, you know, the way that we try to run GE is always thinking about trying to look at, to see uh, how to position the company in the future. And we invest behind, you know, what I would call uh, investable themes or, 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 you know, to keep us disciplined and focused. Um, and we probably had, just in the 10 years that I've been running the company, maybe, you know, uh, 10 or 15 that have been like that. So I would say, you know, Kenneth, like uh, we decided more than a decade ago, we were going to be long emerging markets, right? Before it was cool. So we, we said, this is going to be a space we want to be in. And we invested consistently behind that. Um, we decided maybe eight or nine years ago that the oil and gas industry was going to evolve the same way the aviation industry evolved. That it was going to be more technically based that there was going to be room for somebody that was a technical leader, an aggregator, and so we made big investments in the oil and gas space. And so we kind of treat this like one of these big investable themes. I don't know that it will define the, necessarily the future for GE, but I do know that this is going to redefine the way that we uh, interrelate to our customers. And this is, for a company that has a huge service footprint, this is clearly going to distinguish how successful that part of our businesses for the next five or 10 or 15 years. The whole economic theory of the conglomerate is that it actually has scale across multiple industries and you can apply learnings from one area to another. I can understand why the industrial internet, big data, you can actually, it, it might lend itself to cross applying these things. But at the same time, I can also understand that you need to have such domain expertise in each sliver that in fact it doesn't. How do you see the industrial internet as a company? Do you think that, I mean, obviously you think you're well positioned because you, you're going into this, but is it because you have the domain expertise or because you can cross apply this broadly? No, it's a, it's a great question. There, there are four things inside the company that we really try to drive, uh, four or five things across the company. Uh, one is technology, so material science gets driven across the company. We leverage our global footprint across the company. Uh, we very much uh, uh, focus on uh, uh, scale in terms of shared services, manufacturing scale, people and culture. And then the fifth one is in the service area. And so I think what we found is that whereas uh, each business is going to have applications that they derive uniquely, the backbone of how we think about cloud computing, uh, uh, data relationships, you know, the relationship we have with Pivotal and things like that can be used in aviation, healthcare, energy across our platform. So we treat this as an enterprise initiative that gets augmented by having applications in each business, but we think it's one we can scale. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Phil, tell me, how do, how do you see the industrial internet and big data? Why does it matter so much to, to Northern Power? Yeah, uh, thank you, Ken, and good morning, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Perhaps if I could just, just set a tiny little bit of context and, and in which to answer the, the question. I'll, I'll try and keep my remarks um, very much focused in the space where Jeff, where you were earlier this morning, in, uh, specifically where, where GE are focusing. But if I just explain, n number one, we're, we're a, um, a distributor. We don't generate the stuff, impressed as I am with this fantastic, <laughs> fantastic form of facility and, and, and so on. Um, but we're the, we're the wires um, in Yorkshire in the northeast of England. So for us, it's all about shifting power to the users. Um, we're about to publish 
Um, our business plan as part of our regulatory process, that actually goes live less than two weeks from now, so I'm, I'm very kind of full of that at the moment. So if I just say to you that in, that in that plan, well, this covers 2015 through 2023 and, and with a decent look at the, uh, at the eight years that follow that, in that plan we've identified four things that we think are important. And I'll, I'll focus back in on two of them. Um, but we think the big four things that drive us, um, in no particular order, um, affordability, this is an issue where you know, energy prices are going to continue to rise. Um, as a nation, we're not creating a greater number of, of wealthy old age pensioners and people who are going to be able to continue to pay that. And the reality of the, the, the other end of, of the spectrum that we'll probably spend most of our time this morning is there are people who can't, who are choosing whether to eat or heat their homes. Um, and, and as a society, we can't ignore that. Um, second of all, in that time period between 2015 and 2020, um, we will finally break the, um, the kind of paradigm in this country where we don't actually know when people use energy in their homes, we guess. We've been, we're doing that on the basis of profiles that were developed donkeys years ago before I joined the industry. So smart meters will be in people's um, homes by that time, um, 3.9 million in the case of, of our part of the country. Um, now, those are the two areas that I'm not going to talk about today. So, so th th those are hugely data-driven, as you can see. Um, and then on top of that, I would then um, add, I guess, two other points. Number two, um, or number three, sorry. Um, by the time that period is finished for us, what we've realized is that the, the people who will be my age at that point will be the older end of, of the Gen Ys, the millennials who've, who've always had the internet. They've, they've not traded with companies um, by letter and telephone and so on. So that whole thing is pushing us in that direction. And then finally, in the biggie, um, is that we have this whole low-carbon agenda. Uh, Jeff touched on it earlier in terms of alternative forms of generation. Well, that's got huge implications for networks like ours. And just to kind of put some numbers on it, so th this goes absolutely to the heart of our kind of strategic core, the ability to be more intelligent about what we do. There's a huge range of possibilities as to how fast people will adopt at the user end these low carbon technologies. Will they, how quickly will electric vehicles, for example, replace um, conventional fuels? And how quickly will electric forms of heating, like air source, ground source, heat pumps, replace what we know and love today? Um, well, in terms of just the power network, forget the demands on power stations, for, um, pre uh, past and present, but just the power network, the, the range of possibilities spans um, over an eight-year period, easily in, a, in one sixth or seventh of the country, around about half a billion pounds. Just to reinforce the power network. Forget what people are spending on creating the, network, the, the, the energy in the first place, just on running the network. The span of benefits in an eight-year period, in the second period, when that really kicks in, and, and if we see a significant decarbonisation of transport and heat, the span of the benefits have a present value today of around about, we could make an investment of around about 50, 60 million pounds um, with a little bit of an advancement of a similar amount, so less than 100 million pounds, with a present value of over 350, our numbers are saying. In, in the government scenarios, not in things we've dreamt up, but in government-based scenarios of take-up. So to try and paint it as a picture for you, know, how important is it for us? Well, the, ca the capability to run our assets in a much more active way is absolutely central, I would argue, to all four of those things that define our future. So in simple, in simple terms, it's, it's quite important to me, really, Ken. Great. Je <laughs> yeah, in simple terms, I can, I can see that's the yeah. case. Jeff, when you hear this sort of thing, what do you think of? I mean, what, what's the opportunity for GE here? So again, I... I've, been, uh, I've spent 30 years talking to people like Phil about problems like that, right? So I think it's, uh, I always try to train the guys in GE, the people in GE, to read their, our customers' annual reports, to understand their income statements, to know how people like Phil get measured, uh, what's important to their company, and then try to translate that into what we do in GE. You know, I think sometimes big companies you feel like it's just about you, you know, and it's not really about you, it's about how you interface. So I, I listen to problems like this, and so if you just take that in its rawest form, we, we can self-fill transmission equipment, distribution equipment, that's our, been our historical relationship. Uh, it, it, uh, we try to gain market share versus our competitors. We want it to be reliable, re reach the right price points. Uh, and, be, uh, and be effective, and then when it breaks, we fix it. That's probably solves 50% of Phil's problems, right? And now it's about uptime, it's about wheeling power, it's about knowing what time of day it is, it's about optimizing when wind comes on the grid, when, when uh, baseload comes on the grid, and that's really about software, it's about user interface, it's about analytics. 
And I can drive an analogy like that in every industry that I call on. I, you know, I always find one that I, I can tell it because it's mainly about U.S. and North America. A class one railroad in the United States, right, they have a metric called velocity that they all get paid on. And it basically takes the number of locomotives they have, how many miles each one goes on average each day. So the average, no, no one ever guesses the right number. On average, a locomotive at a class one railroad in the U.S., a well run goes 20 miles a day. You say, holy shit, how can that be, you know? And it's just, you know, things break, they don't know where they are, they're trapped in a rail yard, one, one breaks down in the Rocky Mountains, you, you know? So solving velocity is a little bit about the product, but it's massively about the information. And that's why, you know, I, I can go down each industry and tell a similar story. So I, think, I always think about start with a customer, solve their problem, know how they get measured, know how they make money, and try to translate that into strategies that we can execute in GE. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, when people were talking about the, uh, the, uh, the Internet of Things, I spoke to some doctors and they were saying that the biggest thing that they wanted to do was throw wireless sensors on medical equipment and medical instruments, yeah. and, and just even and just surgical scalpels and all this. I said, oh, for anti-theft. They said, no, because the biggest problem we face is we don't know where things are when we need them. Very basic things, as you said. Twenty. So we've away. we've got we've got we call it hospital operations management, right? And what it basically does is track assets in a hospital. The simplest of all applications, but they don't know where they are. So, you know, let's start there. And then I I, I looked at your slide on really what we call molecular diagnostics. That's also big data. That's that's more on the prevention side. But again, I, I just think there's a uh, Industrial companies have been slow to this evolution. We all, we all, you know, all of us use uh, Amazon. You know, our kids use Facebook. You know, I, I use LinkedIn, things like that. All of those technologies are evolving back in the industrial space in, in, in really powerful ways. We have almost 20,000 field service engineers. These are people that are going out in harsh environments to look at gas turbines or jet engines. You know, we can now, allow them to visualize when they're there, exactly what has to happen, go back to headquarters automatically in terms of seeing what has to happen. So the technology field is opening up to us dramatically. Yeah. Bill, as, as, a, as someone who is operating an, an older company, mm -hmm. what, is it, what are the things that you'd actually like to do but can't do? Why can't you do it and what would it take for you to be able to overcome that obstacle? Yeah, I mean, it, some of that can be quite embarrassing to own up to, really, because I think sometimes, perhaps not in, in amongst friends like this, because not more people would, would have a feel for it. But I think the fact I mentioned it earlier, the fact that we don't, nobody really knows when energy is used in a house. I think that's quite surprising, really, and quite shocking when you just stop and think about it. Here we are saying, well, the generating stations in this country, again, very apt in this particular place, um, are reaching the end of their, their kind of natural life. We've got a lot of money to spend. Um, and the issue is, how much will we need? Have we got enough security? Are we dependent on Russian gas and all the rest of it? And the truth is, we know how much it is in aggregate at any one time, but we don't know who's using it. So th even simple things like that the, the, will move us on, will we'll, we'll open, the, if you like, the window um, and let the light flood in a whole host of things. An illustration I shared with a couple of people earlier this morning, it's not that long ago, it's in my career, 10, 15 years, that we've got our first proper access from substations that had been installed since the immediate post-war era, era, where we could actually see time series data as to what, how, how many half hour periods in the year that substation had been over what we'd call its firm capacity. In other words, if, if half of it, they're usually built with two um, transformers in it, if one transformer was out, we designed them to be able to cope on the other one. How many times a year does it actually get to a situation where the demand is greater than one of them? Hopefully it's never greater than two of them. Um, oh, we have got problems. But we only, it's not said 10, 15 years, we used to rely on a, a dial on the wall that said, you'd walk in the substation and would say, yep, at some point since you last looked, or last since someone last reset it, whether or not they may have forgotten to do that as well, at some point since they last reset it, this thing has passed the dial. Don't ask me how many times, don't ask me how long it stayed past, it just went past. And that would have been the key piece of information 15, 20 years ago that drove a 10 to, five to 10 million pound perhaps investment decision to replace that substation. You get yourself half hour analog data in those days, that's all it was, just to say actually it only happened for one half hour period in the whole year, it's not worth it. Versus 
a city centre that's growing quickly, like Leeds was at the time um, when we first put this stuff in, it showed us that we had to accelerate investment into that space. So it's, we're in the foothills, we really are, of the ability, but, but the, you made the point brilliantly, the, the time that it will take to move from where we are to where we may end up going um, will be greatly compressed. So, for example, imagine we do get to a situation, as I say, five years, allegedly, five years into the next period I'm planning for, um, every home in our region will be able to tell us what its half hourly consumption is. Imagine then that with the kind of technology that's been talked about um, in outline terms already this morning, um, we could develop demand profiles. We knew what the demand profile of this house was normally. It, it, to your point about the, the genome type mapping thing, imagine how we, it, it's, it's, it's minuscule compared to that problem, that we'll be able to say, well, that, pr that house usually does this, and now it's doing this. Now, conjecture the world where that house is occupied by, um, I don't know, your elderly parents who are dependent on a piece of medical equipment like a dialysis machine or something, and now your power company is saying to you, you might want to give, give your parents a ring, Ken, because we haven't seen the demand profile we would normally see. <laughs> now, we moved from a world where 15 years ago we were blowing 5 to 10 million quid on an investment that actually we probably didn't need to make because we didn't know, to a world where we're telling you, you pro hopefully you don't have a problem, but you may want to check. Now, the, the possibilities are, are endless, and we're only just getting to the beginning of it, but as a company, we, we, we're absolutely committed to try and unlock this for our customers. I think the thing that's worth, why I'm so passionate about our part of the equation, not to be dismissive of others, it's just inspirational what, what, what's already been talked about today, but as a, as a power network company, the clue's in the name, we already are connected into every home in our region. The, it physically exists. So it, it, the possibilities, I, do, I get it that there's the material science piece and the optimization of the hard assets that are there and making them last a bit longer and, and tell us a bit more easily when they're going to fail. But the possibility of us then being able to, in that time window, start to aggregate the information and allow the users to dynamically play. At the minute, they're a complete, effectively, intellectual, they're a static component in the supply-demand balance. Make that data available and, as you say, reuse it in another space. They can now become a very, not only do we understand them better than we, under, than we now understand them, but they can become active participants in the whole process by telling us, well, I'm okay. If you want to take, if you want to limit, if my demand wants to be limited to half its normal maximum for the next two weeks, that's fine by me. I'm not going to be in the house. Take it down. They're now trading their, their demand side response potentially for a reduction in network capacity plus all the energy that they're saving by not being in play anyway. So there's some huge possibilities. It's a, it's a massive shift for us. Great. What I'd like to do now is turn to the audience and give them a chance to ask their questions as well. So uh, all of you have your Blackberries. Your Blackberries are not simply for voting. They are also serve as microphones. There is a little button that looks like a microphone. If you do have a question, please stand up. I'll call on you. And then uh, press the button, use the mic, introduce yourself, and ask your question. Who has the first question? You're not allowed to be at a private venue with Jeff Immelt and Phil Jones and not have a question. Good. The first question. Hello. I think I, yeah, 
Um, wow. Um, it's a heavy question. <laughs> yeah, like, well, I think there are several out there, so I'll just try and pick, pick one <laughs> off and look as though I, that was an intelligent answer. No, I mean, seriously, I, I, it doesn't worry me too much. I mean, I, in the sense, yes, of course, but as I said, the foothills, we're in such shallow foothills. You, if you stood at right of the North Pole, everywhere is south from there. You can't go wrong. So to be in a situation where we know nothing at the moment, virtually, to starting to know something, of course we'll make some mistakes, of course there'll be things where people respond differently, and maybe that's part of the learning. I mean, we're proud to be running the largest, I think it's still the largest, smart grid project in the country, up in, up in, uh, up in the northeast there. And we're already finding that, yeah, there are all sorts of behaviours that are, you might think are a little unexpected, um, or maybe they are expected once you apply the humanity that Ken talked about. For example, people with PV on their roofs um, adjust their demand profile to use the electricity that they made. They made it, they want to use it. Why that would matter, there is a slight economic incentive to it, to be fair, but um, setting that aside, people are quite kind of influenced by that. Um, that we've, we've received lots of, and one of the folks of that project is, is, has, to be, has been to bring social scientists along with technology, because as I said, because we're already connected, I guess in a sense, Jeff, I'm signaling, I think in certainly the power space anyway, the ideas you guys are having are already literally connected to customers, to real customers to the end of the, so it's not an, a back office engineering issue. It's already r sitting there, wired up, literally, to the customer's home. So the respond, there will be a response. Do we know what it is? Perfectly, no. Does it matter that we don't know? I don't think so. Um, but if it does, okay, it's not been the most expensive way of finding out because all the intuition says, look, this has got to be a good thing. We, we'll, we'll have some things we've got to back away from for sure. So I don't think I worry too much on that score. I think it's a matter of, of the, the challenge that you put your finger on from my point of view is something that we've identified in our, in our planning again, which is we're, we've been a brilliant reactive business. I'm extremely proud of what, what my business and my colleagues are capable of. You know, the, snow, the snowstorms come, the, the, wind, the wind storms, everyone else gets told to stay at home. We put 500 people out into the field and fix the power network in a day. We're great at reacting, but the innovation that we're going to have to come up with actually will be partly directed at stimulating a response that we do not control, the kind of thing you just talked about. Can we get people to adjust their demand profiles, to take the max demand of the network down to a certain part of the day? Can we incentivize them? Is it worth it? Or are people just going to say, I don't care enough. It's £10 a year. I'm not interested. Leave it. I don't care if the community can bundle it all together and create some kind of community trust that helps some old age pensioners in our town pay their energy bill. I don't care if we can send some kids to college that wouldn't otherwise be able to go. Connecting the human side of the equation to the kind of hardware side. But my instinct is, look, we've, we at least owe it to ourselves to go there. I, I would add just, uh, uh, just a way that I, it helps me think about some of it just from my own experience is, when you think about uh, digitization, the internet, whatever, whatever you want to call it, um, there's a connectivity benefit that we've all experienced. Mm -hmm. And then there's a decision support benefit, right? Making better decisions yeah. faster. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why analytics has such power, right? So connectivity, I, I think about it, I, I've, I've had a 15 year point of view on uh, the healthcare industry. And if you walk into any hospital CEO, they'll say, you know, Jeff, I've just wasted $5 million on an EMR. My board is all over me. I, I hate myself. I can't believe I did it. That's connectivity. That's 10% of the benefit. Allowing a doctor to pick the right osteoporosis drug right the first time, that saves money. That's analytics. So I, I think this, the, the power of connectivity is 10%. The power of making better decisions faster is the other 90%. You know, yeah. the internet drives connectivity, yeah. decision support analytics, that makes decisions. That's why I think, you know, look, data and analytics, it's the modern buzzword, everybody loves it right now, but, you know, making better decisions faster is where the productivity yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. It's also doing it, because to take Phil's point, consumers never want to save 1%. Mm. It's, it's meaningless to them. It's only a centralized actor, a company, that can do that and, and have the responsibility sure. to do that. And yeah. we've seen that with climate change initiatives where we realize that we have to shift the focus from the consumer to the company, the centralized agent that mm -hmm. could do it. Yep. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, I see two, the gentleman in the back and then the gentleman in the front, please. You have to press it down. I think you have to yeah. hold it down. Yeah. Keep, keep your finger on it, yeah. 
Good morning. There we go. So good morning. Uh, I'm Jimmy Dusen with Abbasilis from uh, Eurobank International and with your chain. I read with uh, great interest. Thank, thank, all, thank you for the invitation to be here. I read with great interest all the literature behind the PCC gains in healthcare. I think it's exciting. It's great for us providers. I have a question though. I think that uh, potentially you should also have your focus not only on the PCC gains but on the quality of the patient of the services. I do believe that uh, as a uh, big part of the medical service is related to technology, let's say to the uh, application uh, service, let's say to the imaging protocols used to operate the MRI machines and so on, we do rely mainly in what our physicians uh, were taught or trained in the university and uh, we do believe that uh, if it could have been a risk benchmark between different ways to produce different examinations uh, uh, then you, you can find the best and uh, the highest, uh, the best way to do so. So I, I do think that uh, those words in the right direction will help us uh, provide uh, an examination and we can prove our goals on data. I think that uh, if you focus in, uh, in how to raise price, I think it's also a great opportunity, which is not quantified maybe within this 1%. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think healthcare, again, uh, you know, we use to a certain extent efficiency because you can, you can measure it. But I do believe in healthcare, one of the big benefits is going to be, you know, you know again, so, so everything has to be done in the context of uh, what's best for the patient and privacy and things like that. So I, I, I would start with that as a, as, a, as a premise. But the technology in healthcare is going to be such that really physicians everywhere should have capability to the best practice, the best protocol, uh, awareness of, of, uh, of capability uh, instantaneously. You know, that's got to be the vision, and I think that actually is uh, uh, very possible and is imminent in many ways. So I think both from a healthcare standpoint, how you make sure that the equipment is, has uptime, how you drive productivity, but you know, we have a joint venture in Seattle with Microsoft called Caradigm which is really about providing, you know, uh, uh, let's say you have a, a, a sepsis program, an infection program in an emergency room, every best practice that exists in the world, what are the decision rules, what's the, what's the capability, and I, I just think it's in the next five years, that's gonna be pervasive in, in healthcare. There's a question up front, please. Good luck. <laughs> good morning. Great. Thank you for a very good morning. I'm Laura Spinusko from the Green and Red Fair Town in Sweden working in healthcare. And I just have two quick questions. Because it's easier to make the questions than make the answers. <laughs> the thing I really is interesting in is the 1% savings. What are your expectations that we will do with those savings? <laughs> I'll let you do the second question, Phil. No, it's not. <laughs> well, the second question, no, I don't think so. Um, the politicians, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. No. We'll never get rid of them. <laughs> the first one, very briefly, I mean, in our case, I, I can't comment uh, in other markets. I don't know anything about them. I've spent my, I'm a, I'm a user of them, not, not, a, not an expert in them. But in the space that I do know a little bit about, they will, those savings, in our case, if we can make 1%, Compound saving just on the direct cost we'll spend over that period of time I talked about. Our share of that is about 150 million pounds, just 1% per annum um, over eight years, and that rolls then keeps compounding, obviously. Um, that would go, it's got to go back into bills. As I said, affordability is a big deal. It's all very well getting inspired by all of these things, but it has, to, it has to leave a civil society where people can afford to heat their homes and kind of take advantage of the basics as whatever we define the basics to be, which move, I get that. But um, I think we've, we've added some things to the basics, like things like this, and the ability to tweet and Facebook and all the rest of it. And we're leaving some of the real basics, you know, the things that Maslow would have at the bottom end of his hierarchy of needs. We're leaving some people behind on that. So anything we can save, its first destination, in the absence of an even better idea, and it have to be a good one, is it falls back into reduced prices for customers, no question. So I, I would just echo a little bit about what Phil said. And uh, Marco is the economist, and I have to say, as uh, I'm not, a, I'm not an economist, but more just a business perspective is, 
I, I totally believe that productivity leads to growth. Yeah. And that, and that as societies, economies uh, become more productive, they also stimulate innovation that drives growth. And in many ways, I think the issues that Europe has today and that the United States has today is our rate of productivity in the United States has declined for the last decade. Uh, the rate of productivity in Europe has declined for maybe longer than that. And I view this kind of innovation as exactly what these economies need to stimulate long-term yep. growth. And, and, and as you create long-term growth, this is going to create jobs. Right. Yeah. So I, I view this as a, as a liberator of economic uh, value mm. that, that is going to turn around and, uh, and create productivity. You know, I've spent, I've spent the week traveling Europe. And you know, I, I run a big multinational uh, company. And, and Europe, is, uh, Europe is important to us, right? From, we've got a big historical footprint and things like that. And so, you know, what, what my employees here in Europe say is, what's our vision, right? Because if you just woke up and read the newspaper, every multinational is complaining about their European business, you know, because business is tough and it's slow. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so all week I've been working with them, but it's, but it's really a couple things. I'd say the first thing is, all of us have to make our European uh, operations more productive. We still have multiple country structures. And we ought to use this opportunity to make them efficient in the standards with which the European Union was meant to create somewhat. And so we're going to do that, right? I think the second thing is, is we need to be very focused on our customers right now in Europe and hopefully distinguish ourselves with our customers in Europe. But the third leg of the strategy has to be to take those assets in Europe that can be globally competitive, that, that really are strong and have the chance to play either pan-European or around the world, and we should double down on those right now. So, so the extent to which these in healthcare or in other places can be really great assets, now's the time to do it because people undervalue that about Europe right now. Mm -hmm. So if you think you've got an asset that is globally valuable, it's, it's undervalued right now, and now's the chance to make an investment. So I, I think innovation has to be core to Europe, and the productivity that innovation can drive has to be a core competency of Europe. And right now, everybody just sees all the negatives, right? So I think some of these elements are things that can be part of a better competitive structure as time goes on. Yeah. Great. We have time for one more question. Uh, I see three. Why don't I let all three people give their question, and then I'll ask for some. I see four. I'll get all four, and then we'll have a summation from both speakers. Around Robin with <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good. That's right. Good. So um, we're going to take it from left to right, please. We'll go directly to the next speaker. Yeah, next question. <laughs> Press down. Okay. Yep. So the question was on how will business models change based on this initiative? Yeah. Great question. Um, there was a gentleman in the back and then in the front, so please in the back. Hello, Robert. I'm Jacob, a student from Imperial College. My question is, uh, 
question would be in your book, you talk a lot about the mindset and that there's a lot of companies out there that have been formed with that mindset of big data like Google. And GE certainly is probably not been based on that mindset, but now it's trying to get the transformation. My question would be, how are you trying to achieve that internally to, to get the transformation towards big data analysis? Good, great. And the final question, please. Good morning, my name is William Beckho. I have to know the clinic to put best hungry and use cheap equipment. And so my question relates to healthcare. I understand that I'm a big fan of technology using technology to heal people. But in healthcare, there's also a very biological component of the person, lifestyle, what could I do? Can you talk about being able to predict something a year ahead of time when it came to infection uh, in certain cases? What can GE do or what can we use technology? Or how do we use technology to get people to stay engaged in their lives to head off certain diseases that they may be able to do for a whole lot So I'm going to give Phil the one on data privacy. Okay. <laughs> I'll, take that. I'll take the other three. No, All right. I'm just very responsible. <laughs> yeah, perhaps I'll, t I'll, I'll comment on privacy and if I might just very briefly on mindset because um, I think that probably hits on us too. I think the privacy one is fascinating. I think it's, it, it, it's, it's probably the one that needs the most grown up and responsible conversation at both ends of the spectrum, because at the one end, it is so easy to paint the, the horror story and the scare story and the, and the quite right and proper concerns around people's privacy and, and even civil liberties. At the, other, at the other end of the spectrum, um, and I've had these conversations with politicians in this country um, over the last few years, particularly around, around things like smart meter data, where people would say, oh, you know, privacy, privacy, and, and I totally get it that that's, an, that that's an issue that's got to be held and handled responsibly. But we've also got to keep things in proportion what data are we actually talking about? Where might it actually lead? And where is society going in that respect? Um, th as I said, the, 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 the millennials, the, the, the Facebook generation, they care so, the postmoderns, they care so much less about privacy than, than my father did, than I probably do. I, I don't really get Twitter. I mean, I know how to work it, but I'm not really sure why anybody would want to know all the things I might want to tweet. So I don't tend to do it. My kids, they just can't stop. They, they have, not in that sense, their, their sense of privacy is different. So I guess I'm just signaling it's a very big discussion. It's tectonic scale with moving parts that are huge. But the scale of the benefits and every other advance that's gone on in society, it seems to me, has had to tackle these kind of things. If we want to paint it as the big scary, it's going to come and get you in the night, we can stop everything dead in its tracks and do nothing. If we want to be disregarding of it, we'll commit some horrible offences against, against our fellow humans we can't afford to do that. So it is the one that needs the biggest, I think, most responsible decision. Very briefly on mindset, I hate to sound kind of chintzy and cheesy, but collaboration is, our, is, is the word we use where that's concerned. We are not oriented toward these kind of things. So for example, as we tried to take, be one of the pioneering companies, pioneering, um, we were the first power network company in this country that allowed anybody to buy anything from us over the internet, and that happened two years ago. I mean, how pioneering is that? But, the, but in order to start to think in that way, we've had to get people who think digitally, not people who can just code up websites. And, and bring them into our organization. I don't mean hire them. I mean bring them in as partners and have them sit in our decision making, our, our strategic formation process, as opposed to just our implementation at the other end of a procurement decision. So I think from our point of view, we think it's much more about active participation. So I'll, I'll just whip around the four questions. I think on the, the data, the privacy question is a great question. I think there's two issues. One is cybersecurity, the other one yep. is data and privacy. We're working very hard on the cybersecurity point. I think the data privacy, what we'll try to do is join industry collaborations, working with government, and really with the thesis to say, let's not kill this stuff before it starts. Correct. Let's try to find a way that, that accomplishes everybody's goal and try to work uh, together. Uh, the question on business model, I, I really agree. I think we're gonna have to have new business models. We're gonna have to experiment more with risk sharing. Personally, I think that's gonna happen. Whether we were doing this or not, it's going to happen anyhow. And I've always been like a, a, the market rules, right? I, I think there's like, uh, there's two kind of people in business. Ones that say, you know, uh, geez, let's not tell anybody or else they might ask for it, mm. you know? And I've always been like the market rules, let's go. Let, let's try. If we're, if we're not doing it, somebody else will. So I, I view this as going to drive different business connections in our, in, our, uh, in our company. The culture question, I think, is a great one. Um, you know, we've always tried to keep an externally focused company. I think we've had a lot of collaborations with, uh, with ventures and startups, but the fact is, is that we're infusing the company with new talent. You know, it, we, we, we have to uh, 
Uh, that's why we put our uh, analytics center in Silicon Valley. We're, we're recruiting people on the front end in technology. Now, my case is, so when we went out to California, our case is, look, we want the people that have gone to work for the social media companies, we want you to work for GE. Now, here's what we give you. You can solve some of the world's greatest problems. You can work on energy, you can work on healthcare, you can work on aviation, you can work on transportation. You can see how these stories are gonna end because of our scale. Our value proposition for these guys is pretty good. But we'll never get there without infusing talent from the outside. And we, we know that, not just at, at uh, entry level, but at, at uh, you know, the people that we're hiring are coming from Cisco and Oracle and other places. We just, we just have to do new talent. And then lastly, the point on healthcare. I, I actually think that uh, data and analytics is gonna be one of the big answers in healthcare, really in two directions to your question. Uh, uh, one, uh, we showed the chart earlier, you, you showed the chart earlier on, uh, Ken, on the, uh, what I would call a molecular diagnostics, which is all big data. And it's really about, you know, you could take that example and say, this is a doctor, this is a set of researchers that are trying to figure out the optimal cancer therapy for a certain kind of Hodgkin's, right, disease. And really being able to dial in specific therapies for specific patients saves lives, reduces money. That's one end. Uh, the other end is the employee side. And so, you know, we now, as a company, we, have a, we pay a little bit under $3 billion for employee health care. We are trying to educate our employees on their own health, on how they spend healthcare dollars. So there's, and we're using an incredible amount of intelligence for our own employees to say how they can become healthier and more productive. So a lot of the classic healthcare stuff is gonna be solved by data and, and analytics as well. Great. Look, thank you, Jeff, Phil, thank you for uh, your time on stage. Great. Appreciate it. Thanks, great. thanks very much. Great. 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 That was great. Really interesting.